Will Wheaton. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Will Wheaton. I am uh, an actor and a writer. I am a husband and I'm a dad. And uh, I want to start out today um, by uh, being a dad and speaking directly to the kids who are here for a minute. So parents, if you don't understand what I'm about to say, ask your child when we're done and I'm sure she will clear everything up for you. On Friday afternoon, I was putting the finishing touches on this talk and a friend of mine sent me an article that was in the New York Times. It was about a boy named Jordan. Jordan is 11 years old and he loves Minecraft. Now, not that it matters, but I am 43 years old and I also love Minecraft. I recently terraformed an entire island that was made out of sand into a giant bunch of grassland with cattle on it, and I did it in survival mode with no cheats, and I have a giant castle in the middle of it, and it's amazing. But that doesn't matter. What matters is that Jordan loves Minecraft, and he especially loves building mazes and puzzles to challenge his friends. And one of the things that he wanted to do was build some traps that would go off randomly when his friends were exploring one of his mazes. Now, if we were writing a computer program, we would use a random number generator function to randomly decide which tile on a floor in a room would release a flood of lava, start the walls closing in, shoot out arrows. But in Minecraft, we don't have that specific kind of control over things. Or do we? So Jordan thought about this. And he realized that if he built a room underneath the trap room and he put some pressure plates in that room, then he spawned a moosh room in that room. It would randomly wander around, occasionally stepping on pressure plates, activating a redstone circuit to randomly make a different tile in the room above trigger his trap. Jordan, like the computer hackers of my generation, looked at the tools that were available to him. He saw that they did not do what he wanted them to do, so he hacked them until they did. Jordan is my hero, you guys because Jordan used his ingenuity and his creativity to solve a problem when a lot of other people, including me probably, would have just given up. And did I mention that he did this in a game? Because that's really important. It is a huge part of why I think Jordan and people like him are so awesome. He was having fun. He was playing a game and then he decided to do something that was kind of like homework to solve a problem. So the next time you are frustrated with your math or your science homework, the next time you come across something that is a little too challenging or a test that is too hard, I want you to think about it like Jordan. Look at that problem like it's a puzzle and then solve it because that is what scientists and engineers do. And I know that some of you here today are young scientists and engineers. And I know that you are going to build the world that I'm gonna be an old man in. And I think it would be really cool if you made that world kind of like Minecraft. With fewer spiders. Thank you. All right, parents, you can tune back in. When I was a little boy, I was weird, I was shy, 
I was uncoordinated. I was super awkward. And as a result, I spent a lot of time alone with my imagination. I went to the library. I checked out as many books as they would let me check out at one time, and I read them all. When I was done, I let those books inspire my imagination so I could create my own things. And whether I was writing my own story or drawing something I'd only seen in my imagination, it was science fiction that inspired me the most. Because in science fiction, anything was possible. A kid my age didn't have to struggle with math or sports like I did. He'd just have his personal robot do his homework for him. Or he would use his cybernetic implants to predict where the ball was going to be and then let his mechanical legs put him there to catch it. Earlier this morning, I saw some kids had built a robot that fired a ball, kind of like dodgeball. They had taught a robot how to play dodgeball. It was my greatest nightmare made real. <laughs> but it was those books that I read, that art that was created in many cases decades before I was born that inspired me to examine and learn and understand the science that powered that science fiction. Those stories put me in rocket ships. They gave me command of supercomputers. They made me the last kid on Earth and said, you've got to survive. They did all of that without being explicitly educational, which, when you're a kid, is code for boring. They sort of tricked me into learning about everything from basic classical physics to principles of organic chemistry to the engineering that would be required to build a Dyson sphere. I never did anything professionally with those interests. I eventually chose a career path that took me into the arts. But I got interested in STEM education and I am passionate about STEM education today because my interest in art turned STEM into STEAM. To this day, I struggle with advanced math. I understand calculus about as much as I understand hieroglyphics, which is super embarrassing because I am fluent in emoji. But there are young people today in America and around the world right now who are watching Doctor Who and Star Trek and Mr. Robot, and they are discovering that they have an interest in STEM education because they are inspired by art. And this isn't limited to just science fiction. Remember Jordan from a minute ago? Jordan wanted to build his traps in his mazes because he was inspired by the Indiana Jones movies. So what's Jordan going to do when he gets inspired by Apollo 13, or the movie Moon, or the TV series Futurama? I don't know, but it's going to be something wonderful. And this is why I believe that art is a fundamental and important part of a well-rounded education. Art education is not an alternative or a competitor to STEM education. It is a fundamental part of it. I want us all to commit to adding art to STEM so that we make STEAM. Now, you don't need to be an art historian to know that we fundamentally cannot understand what is going on in a civilization until we take a good, hard look at the art that it produces. One quick walk through the Metropolitan or the Smithsonian can tell us everything we need to know about where our ancestors were at any moment in our history. It's through the art of their time that we can know what their hopes and fears were, and we can look to their speculative fiction to learn how they were trying to understand the world around them. 
their artistic creations and the artists of their time are just as fundamental to their society and the scientific advances it produced as the scientists who discovered them. And I believe that we need to remind ourselves and our children that art and artists are an important part of the machine of discovery and invention. In the last century, we had television shows like Star Trek to inspire us to reach to the stars, and shows like The Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits to warn us about what we should do when we got there. That art took its place next to the science and engineering of the atomic age, and it challenged our parents and our grandparents to use the destructive at power of the atom carefully, and maybe to even reconsider using its destructive power at all. Right now, a series I love called Black Mirror is holding a smartphone up to our faces to catch our reflection. One episode tells us a story about a woman whose fiance dies and she misses him so much, she buys a clone of him, powered by an AI that makes it look and sound like he's still alive. But she very quickly and very painfully discovers that there is a lot more to a human being than how they look and sound and feel. And spoiler alert, it doesn't end well for her because the intangible but incredibly important things that made him who he was could not be recreated in a lab. He looked like the person that she loved. He sounded like the person that she loved. He knew all the things the person she loved knew, but he wasn't human. I watched that episode, and while it didn't dampen my enthusiasm for AI and cloning at all, it reminded me that there's a lot more to it than the raw science that will make it possible. And I really want the people who will be creating clones of me in the future to think about that. I want them to pay attention to shows like Black Mirror, to movies like Ex Machina, to artists like Banksy, because those works caution as well as inspire. And they encourage all of us to discuss the moral and philosophical issues that accompany technological advancement. Of course, art doesn't have to be heavy and intense. And playing hours of Warcraft, losing ourselves in novels like Hyperion, spending an afternoon with a coloring book, it's a great break for our brains. And that can lead to scientific breakthroughs. I'm really lucky to have a friend named Danica McKellar. Danica is amazing. She is very well known for playing a character called Winnie Cooper on a show called The Wonder Years. I guess I'm talking to the parents again. But Danica is a mathematician. She is the co-author of a mathematical proof named the Chase McKellar Wind Theorem. She tells us these stories of her and her classmates being so neck deep in the language of mathematics while they were doing their research that they would literally walk into walls. So when you're trying to figure out a complex engineering or programming problem, sometimes switching to a different hemisphere in your brain allows you to have some room for a eureka moment. It's like Archimedes, right? I like to imagine that Archimedes sat in his bathtub because he wanted to play with his little boats. This is not in the history, but it's in my head canon. He sat down to play with his little boats and went, oh, I just discovered displacement. And that eureka moment brings me to the fact that you don't need to look very far to see that that A, the art in steam, is already present within the core of STEM. There is so much art and beauty in science. 
We don't get people excited about astrophysics by showing them equations. The easiest way to get another human being excited about space is to point a telescope into the night sky and let them look through it. Math can be complex and confusing, and quite frankly, it could be boring and dry until you start to see the way mathematics expresses itself in the world around us. I love the golden ratio. The golden ratio is the perfect marriage of art, design, and math. It is everywhere in nature. And once you see it, once you learn to see it, it's like that little arrow in the FedEx logo. You can't unsee it. It is everywhere in buildings, in sculptures, in monuments, in trees, in sand dunes, in the ripples in ponds. It is doing very well for an irrational number. And speaking of the golden ratio, it is also incredibly present in music. And music, at its most fundamental level, is a mathematical language. So this doesn't mean that someone who excels at doing arithmetic in their head is going to be a great musician, or that a great guitar player is going to magically solve equations with ease. But that's a place where there's this overlap in art and science. And it's a place where someone who is interested in one may not even know that the other one is right there, waiting for them to get excited and do something cool with it. And we have a responsibility to make sure that they can see it. And that brings me to something I care deeply and passionately about, discovery. Discovery through general purpose computing and how it relates to the Internet of Things. When I was 10 or 11 years old, my parents bought our family a personal computer. This was a very big deal in 1981. It was an Atari 400. Yeah, who else couldn't afford the Atari 800? That's what I'm talking about. Frustrating membrane keyboards for life. This computer connected to our television, which means when I wanted to program the computer, I had to fight with my brother and sister who wanted to watch cartoons. It had this membrane keyboard. It wasn't even real keys. It was outfitted with four kilobytes of RAM. As a point of comparison, the document that I am reading from right now was 35 kilobytes when I saved it. This single word processing document is nine times larger than the RAM that made my entire computer come to life. I made some changes to this talk this morning and I brought it in to be printed out once I got here. I put it on this, which you probably cannot see from where you're sitting, that holds 32 gigabytes of RAM. There's more RAM in here than the entire Apollo mission relied on. That is insane. Science! But the thing about that computer is that it would do anything I told it to do. That computer was limited only by its memory and my cleverness as a young programmer. There was not a marketing department locking down features so they could sell them to me after I had bought it as in-app purchases. There wasn't a deliberate crippling of the computer's inherent capabilities, so the marketing department and the manufacturer could then sell me those as additional features once I had paid to have them unlocked. There wasn't even an internet to connect to, so the manufacturer couldn't demand that I connect to a server somewhere to authenticate their DRM scheme so I could use the product I had bought. In other words, we owned that computer in every sense of the word. And whether I wanted 
to copy a game program out of a magazine or create my own from scratch or play a cartridge-based game like Pac-Man, which was so much better on my 400 than it was on the 2600, it did what I wanted it to do. My imagination was the only thing that limited me. Because in those days, it was very challenging for a 10-year-old to max out 4K of RAM. So when 10-year-old me read a book about UFOs and other mysteries, because I was a really big fan of this series called In Search Of, he decided to write a program that would let anyone fill out a UFO sighting report that he could store that could then be searchable by anyone else. Now, all of this existed in my imagination. I knew that UFOs were not flying saucers, but it was an incredibly fun fantasy to imagine. So I turned on my computer. I went straight into Atari Basic, and I spent an afternoon writing my version of a database before I even knew what a database was. I saved it to a cassette tape drive so I could use it again, and that cassette tape drive lasted for weeks until KMET was playing all of Led Zeppelin IV on the radio and I decided that I needed to record it. <laughs> but while that little program lasted, I had created something. I made a thing where there wasn't a thing before. This thing combined my imagination and fledgling technical skills, and I thought it was pretty great. So I was able to create that because I did not have a device that was strictly locked down to just do one thing. I had a tool that I could use to do anything I wanted. This was the difference between being able to take a set of Lego and build anything my imagination wanted and a set of Lego that could only be assembled one way, according to the instruction manual. This is even more prevalent right now in hardware than it is in software. While nearly any computer can run multiple programming languages and open source programs and entire operating systems that are freely available, a lot of the hardware we use to run them, especially tablets and smartphones, we don't really own them. You would expect that when you purchase an iPhone or an iPad, it's yours to do whatever you want with. And that makes total logical sense, but it doesn't survive first contact with the DMCA. It wasn't even until 2015 that Congress affirmed the public's right to unlock an iPhone, but it's still illegal to unlock your iPad. That's ridiculous. And once your iPad is unlocked, Apple can legally turn your device into a fancy paperweight if it wants to. I mean, not that it matters, but this is the reason I use Android devices. I love to tinker with my toys. I've been doing it my entire life. Because the curiosity and love of technological exploration and the quest for knowledge it sparked in me 37 years ago is just as strong today as it was then. So if there is even one child today in this room or someone else who wants to unlock her tablet or smartphone so she can learn her way around its operating system, so that she can make it do something that she wants to satisfy her curiosity and build a thing, but she can't, because our laws haven't caught up to our technology, I have a huge problem with that. Because the worst thing we can tell our curious, clever kids is I'm very sorry, but no, you're not allowed to investigate that part of technology because rights holders have powerful lobbyists in Congress. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the technology that we all take for granted today. I love being able to read a book, get online, play a game, take a picture, even make a phone call from a time to time, all on the same device. But we have got to make sure that we don't trade away the freedom that I took for granted with general purpose computing for the convenience 
of smartphones and an internet of things. We have to make sure that the opportunities afforded to me and my generation 30 years ago are preserved and afforded to the children of today and the children of the future. And that brings me to funding. You are never too young for science. Getting children interested in the world around them and asking them to try to figure out how a thing works is an incredibly good idea. Curious children will naturally gravitate towards STEAM subjects. So let's encourage that and make sure that a child who wants to explore that particular part of our world has everything she needs to get there and keep learning about and make awesome things when she leaves. Now, this is, and I think will continue to be a challenge. Despite the clear and undeniable benefits of a comprehensive education, including science education, not only to individuals, but to our entire society, we have allowed the funding of our schools to become part of the culture wars. And this is as disgraceful as it is predictable. When so many of our poorly named leaders deny scientific consensus on everything from climate change to vaccines, a scientifically literate and well-informed population can be tremendously inconvenient to them. Okay. Good. Let's be inconvenient to them. Let's educate and empower a generation to become real leaders. Let's educate and empower a generation to carry our nation and our civilization into the future. Look, we all know that it's possible to fund STEM education. The money is there. It's just being spent on other things. Making enough noise and applying enough sustained pressure to make this change is not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to be really hard. But when has America ever shied away from doing things that are hard? Everything worth doing is hard. And uh, President Kennedy said as much when he challenged our nation to go to the moon. And right now, it is decades later, and every single one of us has benefited in some way from the commitment that we made in the 60s. Right now, a generation of future scientists can look to Mars and Titan and Europa and beyond because 50 years ago, we did whatever it took to get to the moon. Why aren't we doing that today? Because it's hard? You guys, a generation ago, it was inconceivable to think that we would be able to make a phone call from a thing that we carry in our pockets or that making a phone call was literally the least interesting thing about that device. <laughs> So when I hear the people who control the funding for public education tell us that it's too hard and that as a nation we just can't afford that investment, I seriously question their competence and their qualification to hold office. There is absolutely no excuse for any teacher or child to walk into a classroom and not have the tools and resources they need to create the next generation of scientists, engineers, and makers. And we don't have to put like a particle accelerator or a fission reactor into an elementary school, although that would be awesome. We can start smaller. We can start more basic. We can start on a more accessible, but just as inspiring scale. For example, if we make sure that our schools have the money 
that they need to buy a ton of vinegar and baking soda. I guarantee you that we're gonna have a bunch of chemical engineers in 20 years solving problems that we don't even know exist today because they never got tired of how awesome it is to make a fizzy reaction. If we make sure that kids right now have the computers they need to write software and the internet connections that they need to share their creations, I don't even know what to guarantee you because I cannot imagine what they're going to be doing 20 years from now. I just know that it is going to be amazing. Just last week, President Obama spoke on Equal Pay Day. And he said, I want young girls and boys to come here 10, 20, 100 years from now, and I want them to know that women fought for equality. It was not just given to them. I want them to come here, and I want them to be astonished that there was ever a time when women earned less than men for doing the same work. So I want to add something to that. I want those same people to be astonished that women were ever discouraged from pursuing careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. I want that to be as ridiculous a concept to them as not being able to get in an airplane and go someplace. I want them to be astonished I want them to not believe us when we tell them that there was ever a time in the history of this nation when fully funding public education and providing full and equal access to education, especially science education, that will build the future was not a national priority. And those of us who are the adults of today, those of us who are the parents, the scientists, the teachers, the engineers, the artists and mathematicians of this moment, we have a responsibility to make that world, which could seem like speculative fiction to us right now, the reality that future generations take for granted. We're going to grow old in the world that they make, you guys. And I would very much like it to be a little less dystopian than Judge Dredd. I have one last thing to say before I finish. And I want to speak directly to the young people who are here again. This is your world. We're just borrowing it from you. We're doing our best to take care of it while you decide what you're going to do with it. We have left you a really big mess to clean up, and I'm really sorry about that. A lot of us have tried and are trying to make that mess easier for you to clean up, but we haven't done enough. It's gonna be hard work for you, but you gotta do it. As you get older, as your knowledge grows, don't ever stop learning. Stay curious. Ask all the questions that you can think of. And when you get answers, ask more questions. Make adults uncomfortable with your questions. And if you don't like their answer, ask questions until you do. And then ask more. I want you to take things apart and then put them back together. I want you to take things apart and break them and learn about what's inside. Take things apart and make new things out of them. And don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't do something 
because it's hard. A lot of things that we think are easy were too hard until a clever, brave person said, okay, I'm gonna do it anyway. Sort of like Jordan building his traps in Minecraft. You guys are so lucky. You are growing up at a moment in time when technology is advancing so fast. We are learning so much about the universe around us. Anything you can imagine will exist in your lifetime because you will be able to create it. So be careful. <laughs> and don't forget to be awesome. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much.